Hi everyone, this is a discussion on the musculoskeletal system by um, Dr. Oliver. Again, if you guys have any questions, just uh, jot them down on a piece of paper, bring them to class, or shoot me an email and I will um, answer them as quickly as I can. Okay, let's get started. So if you remember from my previous lectures, I like statistics, um, not necessarily coming up with the statistics, but reading them. So just some quick anatomy facts. Um, muscles are divided into three types. You guys, I know you probably know this from anatomy, but just a, just a reminder. So there's the smooth, the cardiac, and the skeletal. Um, again, the smooth muscles, they're more of your involuntary, so you don't have to think about it. Um, you can find these in your gut, the blood vessels, um, and then um, you actually have your or um, cardiac muscles, which are just, again, cardiac, and then skeletal, which is um, more of the muscles that we think of when we're thinking about the musculoskeletal system. There are a total of 600 muscles in the human body, and there are 206 skeletal bones in the human body, so quite a, few, quite a big number. The largest muscle in the human body is the gluteus maximus, and the smallest muscle, I had to look this one up, but the smallest muscle in the human body is actually located in the ear and is called the tensor tympani muscle. The strongest muscle in the body is the um, theater muscle. And then muscles make up about 40% of a person's body weight. That's why if you ever hear people that are um, weightlifting a lot and they just say, well, I don't know what's going on. I'm eating right and I'm, you know, weightlifting all the time. I'm still not losing any weight. Well, they, they possibly are losing body fat, but they're actually gaining muscle. So just, you can always keep that in mind. Um, the heart is the hardest working muscle of the body and it pumps an average of 25 gallons of blood per day which is typically, I think, pretty impressive. Muscle movement counts for about 85% of the total heat produced in the body as well. So let's just briefly here talk about some normal joint anatomy. So on this slide, I chose the, the knee joint. Um, so it's a um, diarthrotal joint is what it's called, and this is a normal picture of it. So for normal joint anatomy, if you remember from anatomy, there's a synovial space, there's um, synovial fluid, there's the articular cartilage, there's the meniscus, the tendons, and the ligaments. So ligaments and tendons, um, you know, usually people are pretty familiar with them. So tendons connect muscles to bones, ligaments connect bone to bone. The meniscus is specifically located in the knee, and it's that crescent shaped cartilage. Um, you can hear about people getting meniscus tears. That's where that would occur at. The articular cartilage is the cartilage that lines the open surfaces of bones in a joint. Um, and these are located in not just the knee joint, but in other, point, or other joints as well. Then there's the synovial fluid. So this is thick, serous fluid, um, pro provides lubrication for the joint. Um, this is also where um, if let's say somebody has a total knee, um, they, this fluid can actually get infected. Um, and so they actually have to go in and remove some of the synovial fluid. This is where that would occur. And then the synovial space, it's where the synovial fluid is held. Now, some of you may have an interest in musculoskeletal, uh, or may have an interest in ortho, so the musculoskeletal system, um, and then others just have no desire to do so. Um, I, I always liked ortho before I, um, before I started working in the ICU as a nurse, I actually, my very first nursing job, I started working on a med surge ortho floor and I absolutely loved it. Um, one thing though that is important whenever you're work, working with orthopedic patients is you have to make sure that you understand what diagnostic imaging studies you need to choose and why. Um, so that's, we're just gonna talk about that briefly here on the next slide. So how do you choose the right test? So plain x-rays, CT scans, and MRI scans are all um, imaging studies that you can choose for orthopedic cases or people that come in with musculoskeletal complaints. Typically, um, most providers will start out with a plain x-ray, one, because they're cheaper, and um, two, it a lot of the times the x-rays will tell you, it, it'll be able to tell you if anything acute is going on like a fracture or anything like that. So a plain x-ray, typically it shows the bone fractures, it shows damaged bones, it shows any metal um, or other dense objects. If you're really looking for um, 
like a soft tissue injury, then a plain x-ray is not going to be the one that you want to choose. A CT scan, it's kind of in the middle as far as pricing. Um, it detects any bleeding, aneurysms, masses, pelvic and bone trauma, fractures. It's not necessarily recommended for soft tissue, although you can see a little bit of soft tissue on the CT scan. Um, so just keep that in mind. Um, you know, CT scans, if you are um, concerned, if somebody comes in through the ER and they are complaining of pelvic pain, you would do a CT scan. If the CT scan comes back and it, it really isn't showing anything, then you would consider doing an MRI scan to see if anything is wrong with the soft tissue. So um, usually the MRI scan not only because of insurance, but um, typically you will do the MRI scan last. You'll typically start with a CT scan with everything. One, because a CT scan, again, will at least allow you to see if anything acute that needs immediate attention is going on. And then two, a lot of insurance plans actually require a CT scan first before the MRI. So an MRI scan used for injuries of the cartilage, um, meniscus, tendons, lin ligaments, or joints. So again, this is what shows those soft tissue um, those soft tissue injuries. So um, MRIs, they, they do use a magnetic field. So just remember it's contraindicated in patients with metal implants, pacemakers, aneurysm clips, metallic joints. It's, it is typically the gold standard for um, orthopedic cases that is not involving bone. Orthopedic maneuvers. Hopefully you guys remember some of this from health assessment. We're going to go over just a um, brief overview. So this slide I made for you so that it would separate out each maneuver under each um, under each joint. So um, you can utilize this. You can, um, if you want to, you can print it off even and go back through your Jarvis textbook. Um, all of these actually are discussed in your Jarvis textbook. That's where I got this information from. So um, feel free to go back. You can even, um, I think I included in the modules some videos on um, some maneuvers, but um, you can always, so McMurray's test, you can go and type that into YouTube and literally it'll pop up with a hundred different videos on people showing you how to do this test. So these will be on your boards. Um, I remember when I took mine and I, I took mine through the ANCC, but I actually had quite a few orthopedic questions and a lot of them had to do or at least they started out with an orthopedic maneuver so I one had to know how to do it and two know what to do with the result of it so just keep that in mind make sure that you know these I put the more common test first and then the less common test used at the um, at the end of the list under each section so just go back through and you know make sure that you at least have a basic understanding of each of these maneuvers Next, we're going to talk about prevention of injury. So you will have patients come to your office all the time, no matter where you're working at. If you're working in the ER, you're working in um, family practice or urgent care, you will have patients come to you all the time complaining that they got hurt. Um, and they want you to tell them, one, what's wrong with them, but then two, they want to know how to prevent it for next time. So this I wanted to just include some um, just some patient teaching tips that you can kind of keep in mind when you're taking care of these patients. So um, the other day I had a patient come into the urgent care and he had um, just picked up running. So he hadn't been running for a while. He's about 40 years old. Um, just decided that uh, he wanted to get back into running. Well you know, after talking to him, um, he had, he actually ended up having shin splints, but, um, you know, he also, he just noticed that his legs were more tight and uncomfortable. They were restless at night. Um, and so these were, um, these were some patient teaching tips that I was able to pass on to him. So, one thing that you always want to remind patients whenever they're doing any sort of um, movement exercise, um, aerobic activity, or strength training, they need to stretch. Um, specifically, research says isometric exercises are the best, and these are controlled and sustained contraction relaxation of muscle groups. They're less stressful on the joints as well, too. So if you have somebody that has, say, a history of rheumatoid arthritis, um, so their joints are a little bit more 
fragile. Isometric exercises would be perfect for them um, because it puts less strain on their joints. But this is something important to do before and after any sort of physical activity. You always want to tell people to start slow too. We always have these goals in our mind that, um, you know, oh, I'm, you know, I haven't been running for five years, but I'm going to go out and I'm going to run a 5K because I have a 5K that I have to get ready for at the end of the month, even though I haven't been training at all until today. So um, just remind people that they need to set realistic goals. And this, this really goes with anything um, that somebody is trying to change in their life, whether it be a habit or maybe lose weight or better eating or anything like that. You just, you have to start slow. Otherwise, if you don't, you're going to just set yourself up for failure. Um, particularly, or particularly with physical activity, you also are going to set yourself up for injury. Um, the other important patient teaching tip is to have a variety. So a lot of people, um, and, and actually we're all guilty of this, but we tend to do things that play to our strengths. So um, for example, I like to run. If I was choosing a physical activity, I would choose to run because one, that is something that I enjoy doing. Two, it's something that I know how to do. And three, it's something that I can do without even thinking. Um, I don't have to necessarily think hard about how to run or, you know, where to put my feet in front of the other. And, um, you know, so it, for me, that's something that I kind of gravitate towards. Now, if I, um, you know, if, if I, I guess if I'm not really thinking about it, then I guess, you know, sometimes I'll try to weight lift as well too, but that's not something that I tend to gravitate towards. So I, if I'm going to have a variety in what I do, I have to be more intentional about it. So that's what we need to tell our patients is that they need to be intentional about their physical activity and they need to make sure that they are having a variety within their routine. If they are injured, and this is something that is important for us to always tell our patients, um, they need to have they need to have instructions on what to do. So if they are injured, and say you know maybe they're exercising at 8 p.m. at night, so they they really can't get in to see anybody, then they need to not exercise for at least 48 hours. No heat for 24 to 48 hours either, and no active range of motion exercises. We need we need that that muscle or whatever they injured. We need that we need that to um, to have a chance to rest. Um, you also can teach them about RICE, so rest, ice, compression, and elevation, and that is a really easy acronym that actually probably a lot of your patients will have heard, um, but just, a, just as a reminder for them, um, ice, always overheat, um, compression, and then again, we want to elevate above the heart. Next, we're going to talk about danger signs, and these are things that I guarantee you will show up on your boards, so you need to make sure that these next few slides you are very familiar with before going into boards. First one is the cauda equina syndrome, or um, some, I, I've heard some people say it, um, equina, but I, I have more so heard physicians say cauda equina syndrome. Um, it kind of depends on accents as well. So... This is one that you, whenever you have a person come in with acute back pain um, or acute onset of numbness, tingling, or flank pain, um, and they have bladder and bowel incontinence, you need to be concerned about this. So whenever I have somebody that comes in with low back pain and it's acute and they, it doesn't seem like they have ever had anything like this before, the first thing I ask about is, are you, able, are you able to hold your stool? Are you able to hold your urine? Um, if not, then that should prompt you to take immediate action. Um, these people can also have some bilateral leg numbness and weakness. The more common warning signs I put in italics so that those would kind of stick out to you. So like I said, I, I wrote this slide or this slide and actually the next couple of slides so that if you need, if you wanted to print it out and keep it with you when you guys are studying, you guys can do that. So most common cause is a bulging disc and people can develop these from trauma. They can develop them from tumors, um, nerve ischemia, inflammation. Uh, when I was working in palliative care and, um, you know, um, when I was working closely actually with our oncologists um, out in Illinois, um, I actually saw a couple of people develop um, tumors and they they were, they were developed the syndrome from it. So it, it does happen. I've, I've only seen it maybe two or three times, but um, it, it does happen. So it is something that we need to be aware about. 
there's really not necessarily anything for us to do except for we need to know that this is a surgical emergency. So they need an urgent referral. So they need to go to the ER and they need a referral to a spine surgeon because they need a spinal decompression. So um, that is that is the biggest thing. There's really no lab work or anything like that that you need to do, but it's you need to know that you need to refer and it needs to be a very quick referral. The next one is a pelvic fracture. Um, so warning signs, um, it, the more common ones that they could have some bladder and fecal incontinence, um, although it probably is more intermittent. Um, they can have numbness in lower extremity, uh, uh, or I'm sorry, numbness in their lower extremities. They typically have acute pain. Um, they also typically have bruising along their flanks and down in um, the suprapubic area. Um, sometimes the pain will radiate into their groin as well. So most common cause is significant high energy trauma. So um, people they get, um, especially T-boned or um, accident or car accidents where they've been um, in a flipped car, um, pelvic fractures are very common because in order to flip a car, they are um, very high energy movement there. So um, these patients, um, and that's why when EMS brings them in, you know, they have them all boarded and, um, you know, basically strapped down to the board. And, and a lot of the times we will, um, you know, obviously be very careful moving them because they have a high probability of having some sort of fracture like a pelvic fracture. So just keep that in mind, especially if you work in the ER, um, that should always be in your mind. If you hear of a high, um, high velocity accident, then you need to just be aware that you might need to check for that. So intervention, again, a surgical emergency, you really, I, I doubt you would have um, a patient come into your office with this. So more than likely you're going to see them in the ER and they'll already be there. But you need to know that you need an immediate trauma orthosurgery referral. So um, especially because they're at high risk for an internal hemorrhage. So if you need to, if you're working at a rural hospital, you need to know that you're going to, you're going to have to get them transferred out quickly. So more than likely you're going to fly them um, in order to get the correct referral that they need. Now, these next ones you may or may not be familiar with. Um, I do remember on my boards, um, I did have the collis fracture on there. So um, just, just remember that these are um, some of the more common um, danger sign um, type um, musculoskeletal injuries that you could be tested on. So just make sure that you know these. So a navicular fracture, we'll start with that one. So warning signs, um, so they will have wrist pain, but more so with palpation of the joint, and then pain on ax axle loading of the thumb. So initially an x-ray may be normal. However, if you have a repeat one, so they're still having their symptoms, so they're still having these symptoms, they're just not going away, they come back in to see you, a repeat will show a scaphoid fracture. This would be a navicular fracture. So most common cause, so this should this should kind of turn the light bulb on when you're hearing people talking about these type of injuries. So history of falling forward with outstretched hands. So that means that they were falling and trying to catch themselves. This navicular fracture is very common with those falls. So we do tend to see these more in our geriatric population, um, especially if they're in a wheelchair and they happen to fall out. A lot of the times they will fall forward um, if they weren't, you know, slipping down. So if they're, if the you know, say they um, were moving too fast in the wheelchair, if they fall forward and try to catch themselves, they can that can happen. So what you need to know to do is that they need to be referred to a hand surgeon immediately. So, um, you know, these patients, again, need to go to the ER um, because they could have a vascular necrosis. Um, so this needs, this is something that is a emergent surgical intervention. So just keep that in mind. A collis fracture, so warning signs would be swelling, bruising of the joint. Um, the more common ones is that the wrist may appear deformed. So this one is a little bit easier to notice. Um, the navicular fracture isn't necessarily always outwardly deformed, whereas the collis fracture is. Um, they, of course, will have limited range of motion. So if you can imagine that they ha they're having that deformity, they're not going to be able to move it as well. So most common cause, the same thing, is the history of falling forward. So this is the more common wrist fracture though and typically these people will fall with more force um, and that's why they get that deformity so these are very similar but um, they're different in, in um, the warning signs that they present with so again this person would need to go to the ER because they would need a hand surgeon referral 
Okay, last two ones here. Um, so acute low back pain, okay? Um, one thing that we need to also keep on our differential besides the first condition that we talked about is the dissecting um, AAA. And um, these, these actually happen more often than not. So warning signs acute sudden onset of a tearing type low back pain, abdominal pain. Um, it's usually very severe, so people have a hard time explaining themselves because the pain makes them out of breath. Um, they will sometimes also have an abdominal brewy. Um, they'll have a positive colon sign at, sometimes, um, but mostly you will, you, you will hear people describe it as a tearing type pain. It's um, from what I have heard from patients I've taken care of, it's just a very odd sensation. It's, it's you know something is tearing inside of you, but you can't see where. Um, so when you hear people describing it like that, that should automatically click on a light bulb. So most common cause or most common um, type of person you'll see this in is elderly males, um, people that use tobacco are at higher risk, and then people that have um, atherosclerosis disease are more prone to this. So if you have somebody that's on, you know, high, di high dose statins and they've had multiple cardiac stents and, um, you know, just, just keep in mind that they would be at a higher risk for this. Um, obviously, intervention, you're going to send them to the ER right away. Um, you don't even want them to drive themselves. You want to call EMS um, because these people can literally crash within minutes. So they need to get in and um, get this fixed right away. A hip fracture. These you'll probably see very common, and th this will definitely be on your boards. So warning sign is a sudden onset of pain in the infected hip. Um, sometimes they'll have a disfigurement of the hip, and then sometimes the disfigurement won't be as noticeable. You might notice just a slight, um, slight difference in length of the leg, um, but typically these people will not be able to walk. They won't be able to bear weight all of a sudden. Um, so it's that leg shortening is what I was describing. So sometimes that may be extremely noticeable, and then sometimes it's very subtle. It just depends on the type of fracture. Most common cause is a fall, and you'll mostly see these in our elderly patients, although you can see them in, um, you know, in younger patients as well. My aunt actually um, lives out in San Francisco, and there's just so many people out there, and she was walking um, across a crosswalk and got to um, got to almost the other side and somebody had bumped into her and she fell and hit the curb and hit it just right to where she actually fractured a hip and she was 33 at the time when that happened so um, or 36 I'm sorry so she um, I, it can happen it can happen to anybody intervention obviously again all of these if you haven't caught on to that um, they need to go to the ER they need an uh, this person needs an urgent ortho referral so just make sure that you um, like I said the biggest thing is just to make sure that you know the signs and symptoms of things that are emergent and what you need to do in that situation Next, we'll talk about some common musculoskeletal complaints that patients may come to your office with. Um, I just want you to be aware of just the number of differential diagnoses that could go along with each of these complaints. Um, but I also want you to understand um, some of the more important ones that you don't want to miss too. So I put these in a table format, but um, you'll have people come in with generalized weakness. Um, they might complain of just an upper body weakness or maybe just a lower body weakness. And then people will come in with neck pain and stiffness. So the more, um, the more acute um, diagnoses are up towards the top, um, where, well, I guess except for this disuse of muscles, so that one should have gone down here, but, um, you know, like stroke or ALS or meningitis, these are things that you need to not miss. I mean, these are things that, um, you know, that they, they need to be treated right away or get them on the right form of treatment. So, you know, for like ALS, you need to get them to the right person so you need to refer you need to get them diagnosed and they need to be on what they need they need to be on what they need to be on to um, uh, prevent as many side effects as possible so um, these are just they're common complaints that people will come with or come to you with and so you need to make sure that you know what path you need to go down and what questions you need to ask um, I did include some notes on this slide just to talk about in detail some of the um, some of the ones up here that I put, so electrolyte abnormalities, um, you want to look at, of course, magnesium. Generalized weakness occurs more, more often than not with hyper, um, 
So then potassium, mostly hypo. Calcium, it could be either hypo or hyper. So these are, you just want to make sure that you're testing for these electrolyte abnormalities. Um, I actually had a patient yesterday when I worked in the urgent care and they, um, this older gentleman came in with generalized weakness complaint, which again is just very vague. Um, but he ended up, he had been out in the sun and um, he actually had um, low potassium and his calcium was just kind of, it was like a low normal. So um, we ended up just replacing him a little bit and then um, instructed him to make sure that he's drinking not only water, but um, an electrolyte replacement drink, like a, like a Gatorade or something like that, if he's going to be out in the sun and then to make sure he's taking frequent frequent breaks inside where he's in air condition or in the shade um, just out of the sun. So just again, these are things um, that you just need to know what direction you need to go with and what questions. That's the biggest thing because remember you can get the majority of your treatment plan put together by the questions that you ask. So always make sure you're asking the right questions. Again, here's another slide. Um, so nocturnal leg cramps, general leg cramps, falls, low back pain. Um, if you think about, again, we were talking about low back pain, some of the things that you want to make sure isn't, you know, isn't going on, or if it is, then you need to refer emergently. Um, but these are some common complaints that they'll come in with, and these are some possible differential diagnoses that it could be. Again, there's just a few notes on this slide as well, so make sure you look at that notes section. Last but not least is upper extremity claudication and lower extremity claudication. You'll have people come in with these a lot. If you aren't sure what claudication is, it's an impairment in walking um, or it's um, uh, pain or discomfort, numbness or tiredness in the legs that occur during walking or standing and is relieved by rest. Um, so a lot of our... Um, uh, a lot of our geriatric population will complain of of this complaint. So you need to make sure, especially some of these other ones, you know, if they have severe peripheral artery disease, then we need to get them to the proper referral so we can get that um, treated if there's options for them. Um, obviously, an acute one would be an, a DVT. So if we need to um, do a venous ultrasound, then we need to do that to rule out that DVT because that obviously is something that needs to be taken care of quickly. So make sure, again, you know what questions you need to ask, and then that will help lead you down the correct path. Next, I'm going to go over some common musculoskeletal conditions. Um, I did include some other videos in the module that I felt were very helpful and were good. Um, however, some of these other conditions that you may see on boards were not covered in them, so I wanted to just give you some information on them. Okay, so the first one we're going to talk about is plantar fasciitis. You um, you may see a lot of patients with this because this is actually pretty common. So plantar fasciitis is an acute or reoccurrent pain on the bottom of the feet. Um, it's typically caused by little micro tears in the plantar fascia. So if you look over on the picture that I included on this slide, that is typically where people will complain of the pain, although it can actually go across the whole bottom of the foot too. Um, typically, is it is more towards the side of the arch. Um, and so that should be something that kind of gives us away when patients are describing it. So what causes this is a tightness in the Achilles tendon. So a lot of the times um, you'll see this in runners because runners tend to have tight Achilles tendons. So um, stretching ends up being a part of their patient teaching and part of the treatment plan. So higher risk patients for this are patients that are obese. So typically their BMI is over 30. Um, people that um, do a lot of aerobic exercising like that running. Um, a person that is diabetic or a person that has real flat feet so their arch is just very flat. Um, or a person that does any prolonged standing or walking. Um, it, it, these people, it's really important for them to wear good supportive shoes as well. So um, whenever I see any of these patients, it's good to refer them to a um, specialized shoe store that will actually measure and fit their feet. Um, a lot of the times, um, hospitals, I know the one in Marion too, they actually have physical therapists that can specialize in this and they can actually get them um, specialized shoes and or orthotics that will help prevent plantar fascia.
um, our plantar fascia pain. So classic sign is pain worse in the morning. So right when they wake up and put that first initial pressure on their feet, um, and it's worse when they're walking or, or weight bearing. So first line non-pharmacologic is stretching. And again, we're going to aim towards um, getting that Achilles tendon to loosen a little bit. Um, second pharmacologic would be NSAIDs. Um, a lot of the times you compare these NSAIDs with a PPI because these, these people end up having to be on it for a little while. Um, so sometimes we can see that um, a GI upset can occur, so you can always pair it with a PPI. Um, uh, also some other treatments, um, specific um, massage therapists can actually be trained in um, massage for plantar fasciitis. So uh, that's always something good to know is to know your resources around the area that you're working in. So in Marion, I know there's actually two uh, masseuse that are certified to massage for plantar fasciitis. Um, and so I can always refer, and actually my husband gets plantar fasciitis a lot. Um, so we have a massage therapist that's certified in it that can actually help relieve some of that pain for him. You can always promote weight loss, so anything over 10 pounds is actually really helpful in preventing plantar fasciitis. And then there's um, an orthotic foot brace that some um, podiatrists will fit patients for. Um, so that would be something that you would have to refer them to a podiatrist for so they could be fitted. Um, some insurances cover it, some don't, so that's something just to be aware of. There's also a lot of over-the-counter stuff. So there is a, um, there's different types of socks that they can wear at night that will um, put a little bit of tension on that Achilles tendon so that it um, prevents it from tightening up at night. Um, so that's something they could get even just over-the-counter on Amazon or at Walgreens or Walmart as well. Next, we'll talk about degenerative joint disease, and depending on what population you end up working with, you may see a lot of this. Um, so I included a picture on here, too, just so that you could have a visual of it. Um, so typically, you know, it's um, degenerative joint disease. You'll it, It'll go back and forth between... Um, You'll hear that title or just plain old osteoarthritis. There, it, it's the base. It's the same thing. So, um, it's local deterioration of the articular cartilage. Um, it's typically you'll see this. Um, it's a progressive deterioration, um, and then there's also secondary inflammation of the synovium. Um, you'll see that there's this um, subchondrial remodeling. Sometimes there'll be cyst formations. So you can see all of this over there. You know, you can see that where the exposed bone is, and it, it's just progressive. And so these people over time, they'll notice that they're having, um, let's take the knee for example, so that they'll have a little bit of um, pain or almost like a feeling of grinding when they're walking, and it just continues to progress. So there's two different types. There's primary where it develops spontaneously and then secondary where it's due to another cause. So whether it be an injury or a deformity or possibly a disease. This is the most common type of arthritis that you'll see. So some of the risk factors is old age. So again, if you're working with geriatrics, you'll see this a lot. Um, people that overuse the joints. So you'll see this a lot in truck drivers in the knees because they're getting in and out of the truck. Um, so just keep that in mind with that population. And then um, a lot of these people will have a family history of it too. The goals of treatment, um, because we cannot reverse the damage that is done necessarily, our ultimate goal is pain relief. And we want to try to preserve as much joint mobility as much as we can so that they don't have further disability. So some non-pharmacologic approaches, you could encourage them to do some low impact exercises and you wanna encourage them to do this about three to four times a week. Um, if you have a person that is obese as well, encouraging some healthy weight loss. Um, if they're smoking, of course, we never want a person to be smoking because it causes so many problems. So you always wanna to try to very nicely encourage that tobacco cessation. And then you want to avoid any aggravating activities. So, um, you know, if somebody has a pretty severe degenerative joint disease, they probably shouldn't be running. Um, they might want to maybe switch to a um, uh, elliptical or something more low impact. Some alternative medicine that you may hear about is some glucosamine, acupuncture, and the CME supplements. Um, research kind of goes back and forth on these, but some parent or some patients actually um, they think it's very helpful. Um, they it also has very low side effects. So for um, somebody that maybe is on a lot of medications, this might be a good thing for them to try. 
Pharmacologic therapy, first line is Tylenol. They also have the extra strength Tylenol that a lot of people like to use or the arthritis Tylenol. Um, those are just, you know, their names that um, are, you know, that are, have a selling point basically. So um, Tylenol, typically 500 milligrams twice a day scheduled works really well for people and people with osteoarthritis because we know that they're going to have pain every day Tylenol works the best if it's scheduled um, and then um, you know you don't want to schedule so much that they can't have anything in between so if they need that third dose then with that 500 milligrams twice a day they would be able to do that that would still be a safe amount Second line is NSAIDs. Um, you can add a PPI with it, although again with your geriatric population you want to be careful because if, um, if they've had a history of GI bleeds or are prone to them, um, then you definitely want to be careful with the NSAIDs. Third line is topical NSAIDs. For some people this works well, for other people it doesn't. If they're greater than 75 years old, then you want to use this first before oral NSAIDs. If you look in my notes section, I have, um, I, I go um, a little bit more detailed in with the NSAIDs. Um, we look at the risk for GI bleeding um, and then risk for the cardiovascular disease. So just make sure that you take a peek at those. The highest risk for GI bleeding is the um, Toradol. That is the biggest one. So that's not something, and it does come in PO, um, you know, so you want to make sure that you really aren't using that in your geriatric population. Typically, you, you would use a low-dose Celebrex or ibuprofen. Um, for cardiovascular risk, the highest is the diclofenac or high-dose Celebrex. The lowest cardiovascular risk has no, or is naproxen. Next one we'll talk about is rheumatoid arthritis. Um, and you'll probably see a lot of this as well, although many of these patients are managed by the rheumatologist, um, or at least I, I feel like they should. It, it, um, you, you know, rheumatologists, it, it really, rheumatoid arthritis is really a specialized type arthritis and a rheumatologist will really be able to be the one to give them the best treatment. So it is an autoimmune disease. It's more common in women um, and it usually involves multiple joints, although it's more common in the fingers, the hands, the wrist, which is why I included that picture there off to the left. Um, it occurs more often in people that are prone to autoimmune disorders. So if they have an autoimmune type thyroid disorder, they're more at risk to, de to developing a rheumatoid arthritis. It has a um, gradual onset typically. There is a juvenile rheumatoid arthritis that people can also have as well that starts younger in age, but typically you'll see this starting in uh, the 20s. So symptoms that people typically will complain about is um, fatigue or they might have a low-grade fever. Typically, they'll have this generalized body ache. Um, they'll have swollen, um, stiff joints, mostly in the AM is when people will really complain of this. And the joints may feel warm when you're examining. So lab work that you want to make sure is done is you want to check a SED rate. You want to do a CBC, a rheumatoid factor, and then x-rays. So I have on the notes section down here a little bit more information. So I have the expected lab results in RA, so you guys can look through that. Um, and then um, as far as treatment plan, the biggest thing that we want to make sure is that we are trying to give them the best pain management that we can give them. And we want to prevent any further damage from the inflammation. So again, we want to refer to a rheumatologist. Different medications that can be used in, in rheumatoid arthritis I include it in the notes section. Typically, people will start with NSAIDs. Again, these are people that you can also put on PPIs to protect their GI system. Um, you can use steroids, although we try to use those for acute exacerbation of their disease. Um, sometimes they'll do steroid joint injections. Um, there's gold salt compounds as IM injections that they can do. Sometimes they need surgery like joint replacements. Um, and then also a newer treatment that um, a lot of people with rheumatoid arthritis are going to is medical marijuana. Um, and that's something that we'll talk a little bit more so um, about next semester. Um, we'll actually have a provider come in and talk about medical marijuana because he prescribes it. Um, but it, it really does a lot of good for these patients and they can actually prescribe certain types of marijuana for these patients to control whatever symptoms they need to control. So there's lots of options for patients with rheumatoid arthritis. Um, the compliance rate though sometimes is an issue with this population. 
Last but not least, we're going to talk about gout. Um, so if you look in the picture included on the left there, you can kind of see that left foot um, has a little bit of a um, red spot to it there on the side of that big toe that's kind of um, sticking out a little bit because it's swollen and it looks like it hurts. This is a very typical com uh, or very typical presentation of gout. So gout is just um, where uric acids or uric acid crystals deposit inside joints and tendons. Um, it typically uh, is found to be genetic. It's common in middle-aged males that are greater than 30 years old. Um, the biggest thing with gout is that it can cause so much joint destruction if not treated. So the biggest thing is that we need to get these people treated in their acute phase and then also have them on maintenance dosing. So there is an acute phase versus the maintenance phase. Um, that's why the lab work comes to comes in to be important. So you look at those uric acid levels. Um, typically in the acute phase, it'll be elevated greater than seven. Um, so we always want that level below seven. We really want it to be zero, um, but for some of these people it may never be. So the main goal in acute phase of gout is pain control. Um, typically with gout, um, narcotics do not work, so a lot of the times we end up having to use high-dose NSAIDs, which again then you have to watch for GI issues. So just keep that in mind when you are treating these patients. Um, so I have on there are some medications that we use for the acute phase and the maintenance phase. Um, typically, you're going to see a lot of people on allopurinol. I, I see a lot of people on allopurinol, and that's just because it's so cheap and insurance has such good coverage for it. Um, there are other options out there. Um, Indocin is typically used in the acute phase in combination with um, NSAIDs is usually what I see it used with. Um, I, you know, I, as I was making this presentation, I was thinking, um, I, I don't really see as many people with gout in the hospital, um, just because I think, I think family and primary care providers do a great job of, um, preventing the acute phase with the amount of medications and options that they have. So if you're going to be working in a family practice or a primary care practice, um, you may actually see a lot of these patients more so than what I ever would. Um, and, and the nice thing is, is that there, there is, there's just a lot more options nowadays than what they had, you know, five, 10 years ago for these patients. And a lot of the times drug reps even bring around a lot of um, free samples that you're allowed to pass out to your patients. So you can always keep that in mind as well. Okay, guys, that concludes the presentation. Make sure you look at the videos I included in the module. The musculoskeletal system there is just so much involved with this system. So I'm hoping that you guys enjoy the videos that I included. Again, write down questions as you guys are going through the module. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. We have a um, fun lab, I think, that um, you guys will really enjoy um, that we have planned. So um, just uh, make sure you review things before you come. Make sure you also review, I put in a a video on joint injections. Um, we will be learning about those and practicing those in lab. So make sure you review that video before you come to lab. And again, write your questions down, bring them with you, and um, we'll um, answer those questions before you guys finish your last class. Take care, guys.